Imagine for a moment, a small child crawling around on the floor as his parents are watching. He crawls over to a chair, puts both hands up on the seat and lifts himself up so that he's standing. He turns to face his parents and with great effort lifts one wobbly little leg into the air. His right foot moves forward. Shortly follows is the left foot. Then he wobbles and leans forward, but his parents run up and grabs both of his hands, steadying him. He has begun to learn to walk. In the scriptures, walking is often used metaphorically to denote a following a certain course in life. Most scriptures refer to two courses, walking with God and walking without him. What exactly does walking with God entail? Well, the Bible mentions a few people by name who walked with God, such as Noah, Abraham, and Jesus. These men followed the course of life that Jehovah laid out for them. They accepted his guidance and direction and did their best to live up to his righteous standards. Even under persecution, they courageously stood on the side of truth. Their lives showed that they had strong faith in him, even in what seemed to be impossible circumstances. At first glance, this can seem like a lot, doesn't it? But rest assured, walking with God is a unique privilege. Why is that? Well, let's turn to our opening scripture, Jeremiah chapter 10. And we're going to discuss verse 23. And let's see why this is such a grand privilege. That's Jeremiah 10, verse 23. And there we read, I will know, O Jehovah, that man's way does not belong to him. It does not belong to man who is walking even to direct his step. Let's think back to that child we discussed earlier. When those first steps were taken and he was about to stumble and fall, what happened? His parents ran up and they grabbed his hands and they steadied him. And if you've ever seen a parent, when their child takes their first steps, what do they usually do next? They assist him with walking further. They guide him around obstacles and stumbling blocks. According to this verse, mankind without Jehovah is like an infant with no one to steady him. They stand, take two steps forward, and then fall over and over again. Do you see why walking with God is such a unique privilege? As our grand creator, no one knows him better than we do. No one knows he doesn't know us as well as we know. What am I trying to say here? <laughs> no one knows us better than Jehovah does. When he offers direction and we stick to it, only blessings can follow. But what of those who choose not to walk with God? Well, unfortunately, this is the course that the majority of mankind has chosen to follow. And what exactly is the result of this? Well, imagine we take that child from earlier and we leave him unsupervised in a fine art exhibit. What's going to happen? Well, more than likely, he's going to destroy many valuable things around him and even likely cause serious harm to himself. And has that not been the case when we look back through human history? A constant wars, petty skirmishes, famine, and hunger. And especially in the past several hundred years, the destruction of the environment on an unprecedented scale. Yes, human history is riddled with both the suffering of man and the earth itself. But how do we know that this is a result of not walking with God? Well, because he told us. Let's look at Psalm chapter 14. And we'll consider verse 1 together. That's Psalm chapter 14 and verse 1. 
And there we read, the foolish one says in his heart, there is no Jehovah. And what is the result of that line of thinking? The verse continues, their actions are corrupt and their dealings are detestable. No one is doing good. Without a doubt, alienating ourselves from God has had terrible results. Just consider the past century alone. The morality of man has been on a constant downward spiral, and every year it seems to get worse. Even churches are watering down their teachings to accommodate for the morality of man. But where's all of this leading? What is the ultimate end result of this chosen course? Well, let's consider the example of the ancient Ephesians. Their attitude was very similar to the attitude of people we see today. Ephesus was a wealthy city, but the people there were materialistic, fleshly, unruly, overly prideful, and superstitious. In fact, the scriptures describe them as completely alienated from the life that belongs to God. Let's consider two scriptures about the Ephesians. The first will describe what that alienation from God consisted of. And the other will show what the end results of that course of action is. Firstly, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll discuss verses 17 through 19. And just notice there how it describes those who don't walk with God. It's Ephesians 4, chapter 17 through 19. And there we read, So this is what I say and bear witness to in the Lord, that you should no longer go on walking, just as the nations also walk, in the futility of their minds. They are in darkness mentally and alienated from the life that belongs to God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the insensitivity of their hearts. Having gone past all moral sense, they gave themselves over to brazen conduct to practice every sort of uncleanness with greediness. By not walking with Jehovah, the ancient Ephesians led a deplorable lifestyle. And in this next scripture, Ephesians chapter 5, so there's one chapter over, in verses 5 and 6, we see the end results of this. It's Ephesians 5, verses 5 and 6, and there we read, For you know this, recognizing it for yourselves, that no sexually immoral person or unclean person or greedy person, which means being an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of the Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. The scripture helps us to see that the end results for those unruly ancient Ephesians and truly all who stray from walking with God is destruction. Facing Jehovah's wrath, being completely barred from any inheritance of his kingdom. So not only do they lead unfulfilling lives now, but they have no hope for the future either. We don't want that to be us, do we? On the contrary, we want to experience the blessings that Jehovah's kingdom brings. And not just that, but we want to live happy, fulfilling lives now. Well, so how can we make sure that the, unlike the ancient Ephesians and the majority of mankind today, we are walking with God? Well, the best way is to look at the example of those who have done so in the past. You remember those three men we briefly mentioned, uh, Noah, Abraham, and Jesus? We're going to consider the example that they set and see how they walked with God. Let's begin with Noah. Now, most of us know of, or have at least heard of, Noah's story. How he constructed an ark and filled it with pairs of animals, and saving himself and seven other members of his family from a flood that Jehovah caused on the earth, wiping out the rest of mankind. How can we learn to walk with God 
from his example. Well, to start, let's consider Noah's most known accomplishment, the building of the ark. The ark was a massive project. According to Jehovah's measurements, it would have been 437 feet long, 73 feet wide, and 44 feet high. The Bible doesn't specify exactly how long it took to build the ark, but based off of Noah's age when he first received the instructions and his age after the flood, it can be assumed it took several decades, 40 or even 50 years to complete. Jehovah gave Noah specific instructions regarding the ark's construction. And what was Noah's response to those instructions? Well, let's see at Genesis chapter 6. And we'll consider verse 22. That's Genesis 6, verse 22. And here, Jehovah inspired to be written, And Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. He did just so. So the first way Noah showed to have walked with God is by following Jehovah's instructions. And not half-heartedly either, but fully dedicating himself to them. And how do we know that he did this? Because when those floodwaters came, and it was time to get into the ark, and God shut the door behind them, they were ready. And that ark kept them alive for the entire duration of the flood. But there was more than, to Noah's story than just constructing the ark. Let's consider the conditions of the world that Noah lived in. See, there was a reason that God caused this flood. In Genesis 6.11, it says that the earth had become ruined in the sight of the true God. In fact, Jesus compared the people of Noah's day to the people of the last days, the time period that we are currently living in. Let's take a look at what Jesus said at Matthew chapter 24. And we'll begin reading in verse 37. It's Matthew 24 and starting in verse 37, it says, for just as the days of Noah were, so the presence of the Son of Man will be. For as they were in those days before the flood, eating and drinking, men marrying, and women being given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and they took no note until the flood came and swept them all away. So the presence of the Son of Man will be. It's interesting here that Jesus doesn't mention the immorality of Noah's day. In fact, he lists some pretty common activities of daily life, eating and drinking, being married, uh, things that aren't inherently wrong. But what weren't they doing? There was a flood coming, and it's not as if they didn't know. Second uh, Peter 2.5 calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. He didn't just construct the ark. He was warning people for decades of what was coming. But how did they respond? That verse tells us they took no note. They were so caught up in everyday pursuits, they had completely ignored Jehovah's message. But Noah was not swayed by this. He stood firm to his assignment. He rejected the immorality of the world that he lived in. And he did not allow himself to get so caught up in daily pursuits that he lost focus on Jehovah. But now, what about when the directions that are given aren't as clear as the ones that Noah received? What happens when we don't understand them? Or to us, they don't seem to make sense. Well, our next example, Abraham, faced similar situations. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11 and verses 17 through 19. And let's see what instructions Abraham was given. That's Hebrews 11, and we'll start in verse 17. And there we read, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, as good as offered up Isaac. The man who had gladly received the promises attempted to offer up his only begotten son. Although it had been said to him, What will be called your offspring? will be through Isaac. 
But he reasoned that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. And he did receive him from there in an illustrative way. Jehovah had promised Abraham that he would make a nation of his offspring, that they would be a multitude too large to count, and that he would do so through his son, Isaac. But then one day, Jehovah told Abraham to do the unthinkable. He told him to sacrifice his son, Isaac, to kill him. Now, how can God fulfill his promise to Abraham if his son Isaac is dead? Did Abraham stand defiant? Did he say, no, that doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to do that. No. Abraham had so much faith in Jehovah that we read in that verse, he reasoned even if Isaac were to die, Jehovah could just bring him back to life. He walked with God through faith, not by sight. Now, that may seem a little hard to comprehend for us at first, but acting out of faith instead of what we can physically perceive is something we've all been doing since we were children. How so? Let's go back to the illustration of our young child again. He's a little more grown up now. He can speak a little and understand words, and he's walking pretty well. So he can reach areas of the house that he probably shouldn't be able to reach. So one day he wobbles his little legs into the kitchen and he smells something and boy, it smells good. So he takes himself over to the stove where this amazing smell is coming from. But right as he reaches his little hands up to grab onto the top of that stove so he can pull himself up to see what's up there, he hears something behind him. No, hot. He turns around. And he sees his mother standing there, a stern look on her face, waving her fingers at him. Now he knows what the word hot means. He's touched hot things once or twice before. And so what does he do? Well, he wobbles those little legs away from that stove into another room. Now what's interesting about this situation is that child never saw any danger. He just knew that his mother wanted what was best for him. So whether or not he saw the flames or even smelled the smoke or even felt the heat from the stove, if his mom said it was hot, that meant it was hot. The vital part of walking with God is to walk by faith because sometimes the direction from a human standpoint doesn't make sense. Sometimes we don't understand why something is wrong. Sometimes, just like that child, we don't see the danger, but that doesn't mean it isn't there. And the opposite of that is just as true. Sometimes we think something is bad or wrong or dangerous, but Jehovah tells us that it's okay. Just like Abraham and his son Isaac, from a human perspective, that command from Jehovah did not make sense. But when viewed through eyes of faith, the situation can be seen much differently. That's how Abraham viewed it. So no matter what he had to sacrifice, following God's instructions, no matter if he understood the reasoning or not, was his top priority. And his faith was well rewarded. Jehovah promised that through Abraham's seed, all nations of the earth would bless themselves. How so? Well, guess who was a descendant of Abraham's offspring? Our final example, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the culmination of all the qualities we've seen so far, and then some. We're told in the scriptures that he left a model for us to follow his footsteps closely. So how exactly did Jesus walk with God? Well, he had many fine qualities for us to imitate, but we're going to focus in on the one found at John chapter 5 and verse 19. That's John 5, 19. And here it's recorded, Therefore, in response, Jesus said to them, Most truly I say to you, the Son cannot do a single thing of his own initiative but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever things that one does, 
these things the son does also in like manner. Yes, Jesus' entire life revolved around Jehovah and his direction. As the perfect example for us, how can we do the same? How can we imitate Jesus in walking with God? Well, firstly, we need to discern Jehovah's will and make it our top priority, just as he did. And fortunately for us, that isn't hard, as Jehovah's will has not changed. Think about it. What activity did Jesus partake in more than anything else? Preaching. In almost every scripture involving Jesus, whether he be walking down the road, having his life threatened, or quite literally nailed to his torture stake, Jesus never stopped preaching. And that has not changed for us. Mark 13, 10 tells us that the good news has to be preached. And what people are following that command more so than Jehovah's Witnesses. I remember in my economics class in the 11th grade, uh, our teacher was explaining the importance of language in economy. And he asked us the question, what is the most translated website as of right now? Now, we all know where this is going, don't we? Now, a few students thought maybe Google, which makes sense because they translate things. A few others said maybe Wikipedia, their big source of information. But imagine the pride that I got to experience in Jehovah when I could raise my hand and say, JW.org, the website of Jehovah's Witnesses. As of this year, JW.org has been translated in over 1,030 languages. And guess who the second runner-up is? Wikipedia, which is widely regarded as the best source of online information. How many languages is it translated into? 300. Now, while that's impressive, it's nowhere near the amount that Jehovah's people have accomplished. We have truly bought, brought the good news worldwide. And why do we take this work so seriously? Because it allows us to assist with accomplishing God's will, and in turn, allows us to walk with God. How else can we imitate Jesus? Well, earlier, we spoke of the ancient Ephesians. Do you remember how the scriptures described them? As walking in the futility of their minds. Well, in order to truly imitate Jesus and walk with God, we have to get rid of that worldly mindset. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll begin reading verse 22. It's Ephesians 4, verse 22. And there we read, You were taught to put away the old personality that conforms to your former course of conduct and that is being corrupted to its deceptive desires. And you should continue to be made new in your dominant mental attitude and should put on the new personality that was created according to God's will in true righteousness and loyalty. Yes, to imitate Jesus, we have to have this new personality, to let go of the independent attitude of the world. We have to understand that we need Jehovah and his guidance, and that only by humbly submitting to him and his will can we lead fulfilling lives and have a hope for the future. But it's important that we act now. Remember, walking with God is a unique privilege one we do not want to miss out on. So to summarize everything we've discussed, let's turn to Ephesians chapter five. So just the next chapter over again, and we'll read verses 15 through 17. It's Ephesians chapter five, verses 15 through 17. And there it states, so keep strict watch that how you walk is not as unwise, but as wise persons making the best use of your time, because the days are wicked. On this account, stop being unreasonable, but keep perceiving what the will of Jehovah is. We want to do our utmost to walk as wise persons, 
imitating the example of those who walked with Jehovah, such as Noah, who focused on Jehovah's instructions in a world that did not want to obey. Or Abraham, who faithfully made sacrifices for Jehovah, even when by a human standpoint, the directions given did not make sense. And Jesus, who made accomplishing God's will his highest priority. We want to imitate how they stood firm to Jehovah's directions and did not allow themselves to be led astray or distracted by worldly pursuits. We want to strive to put on this new personality, abandoning the thinking such as those of the ancient Ephesians, understanding that humble submission to God's will can only benefit us. Remember where the scripture says their destination is, destruction. And ours, what is our reward for this righteous course? Will we get to enjoy the best way of life now and protection from that destruction to wonderful blessings in the future? In doing these things, we can declare as did the prophet Micah at Micah chapter four and verse five. Let's turn there together. It's Micah chapter 4 and verse 5. And there we find a declaration that we all want to be able to make. It says, For all the peoples will walk, each in the name of its God. But we will walk in the name of Jehovah our God forever and ever. <laughs> 